Welcome everybody to Rochester Lifestyle Medicine Institute's December Lifestyle as Medicine Lecture. I am Dr. Ted Barnett, the president and founder of Rochester Lifestyle Medicine Institute. And it is so good to have you all here tonight. I'm very excited uh, to be able to introduce Dr. David Neubauer in a moment after I give a few more announcements, who will be our, our uh, guest speaker tonight. And he'll be talking about sleep and wellness. So here's our agenda for tonight. We'll be spending about five minutes on uh, introductions. And then Dr. Neubauer has a presentation, which is probably 40 or 50 minutes. And around 8.15 or 8.20 or even 8.25, we'll be going to a Q&A. Around 8.30, we're going to officially end, but usually the question and answers uh, keep going. So we might adjourn what we say into the lobby and continue on for another 10 or 15 minutes or so. Uh, these are some events um, that are programs that we have coming up. We run uh, two uh, programs which are certified by the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. One is the 15-day whole food plant-based jumpstart, which we developed here at Rochester Lifestyle Medicine Institute. Uh, the other is the LIFT project developed by Dr. Darren Morton in tech, uh, Australia. We also have begun health coaching. Um, uh, individual coaching sessions begin anytime. Uh, however, we are also starting a group program on January 23rd for healthy and sustainable weight loss. So that's where people would like to lose some weight. Presentation for tonight, Dr. David Neubauer will be talking about uh, sleep and wellness. And let me just tell you a little bit about Dr. Neubauer. He is Associate Professor of Psychiatry at the John, Psychiatry at the John Hopkins University School of Medicine and Senior Faculty of the John Hopkins Sleep Disorders Center. He is a Fellow of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine and Life Fellow of the American Psychiatric Association, as well as a member of the Sleep Research Society, European Sleep Research Society, and the World Sleep Society, where he serves on the International Scientific Committee. Dr. Neubauer has served on the Board of Directors and Executive Committee of the National Sleep Foundation. He is the author of Understanding Sleeplessness, Perspective on Insomnia, published by the Johns Hopkins University Press. He routinely uh, champions the importance of healthy sleep as a key component in the pursuit of wellness. So with that, I would like for Dr. Neubauer to come back to the scene here, if he could, and turn his camera on. There he is. Hello, Dr. Neubauer. Welcome aboard. Thanks so much. It's great to have you here. Well, thank you, Ted. I appreciate that introduction. Absolutely. And I'm so happy to be here. And uh, you'll, you'll, you'll appreciate my enthusiasm as I go on a little bit. Um, I've been working in the field of sleep medicine for, gosh, um, quite a few decades, going back to the 19... 80s. And uh, during that time, you know, most of that time, I was eating a pretty standard American diet and was thinking, gee, uh, I really should eat healthier someday. And the years passed and the years passed after that. And then finally, a friend of mine lent me this book and it changed my life. It was like a strike of lightning. That was uh, 2010. Uh, so like for the past 13 years, uh, you know, I've been following a plant-based diet, very happily about that, really haven't looked back. And right away, I got involved in um, all sorts of different plant-based activities locally and uh, nationally as well. I was, you know, meeting up regularly with our local um, EarthSave group in Baltimore, um, going to uh, all of the um, National Vegetarian Association summer fests and um, international plant-based nutrition healthcare conferences. And, you know, I was always the person standing in the back because it just seemed healthier to do that. Here I was uh, following um, health in terms of trying to eat well, but uh, wanted to be physically healthy as well, you know, when I was uh, in these various crowded um, auditoriums. And I can tell you that from the very beginning, I was so amazed at the parallels of what I understood in, from a sleep medicine perspective what certain benefits were related to sleep. And in many cases, they totally paralleled the benefits of following a plant-based diet. And so I really wanted to share the information about sleep and circadian rhythms just because they synchronize so well uh, with um, you know, the, the healthy diet choices that, that we can make as well. And so over the years, you know, I was hearing the greats, you know, Michael Greger and Michael Clapper and T. Colin Campbell and Caldwell Esselstyn and Ted Barnett and Neil Barnard and the rest, hearing great information and just thinking to myself, wow, sleep enhances these things as well. And there I am um, going to all that, the Summerfest sessions as well. So 
this is a study that I came upon just a few days ago, and I thought I would share it with you really quick, partly because they had such good graphics built into it. So this is a report that just came out, and you can see that it was several different cohort studies that were involved in five different countries, these European countries and Australia as well. And there were over 15,000 participants. So what they did in this study is they monitored activity. So there were these devices that people wore um, on their thigh for a week, and they were able to calculate um, these five different categories of, of behaviors. People were either, um, you know, um, a significant degree of activity, you know, less active, um, just standing and sitting and sleeping. And look at these six outcomes that they had, measures of adiposity and lipids and A1C. So we like these because we want to eat healthy to uh, enhance um, our metabolic health. And in this study, they were looking at the relationship between these activities. And here's, here's a summary of what they found, and it may not surprise you very much, but at the top, you know, clearly there were the best cardiometabolic outcomes for those people who spent more time in moderate to vigorous physical activities. And then, you know, down a bit is the light intensity physical activity. And then here's what really surprised me, sleeping or standing. And then finally, in the bottom is the sedentary behavior. So if you're filling up most of your 24-hour day sedentary, you are doing a whole lot less to enhance positive cardiometabolic outcomes. Well, it got me thinking that, you know, when I'm at these different lectures and I'm in the back standing, I think that's a healthy thing. And I figure, well, if I was just to go and sit down, I'd be better off sleeping than paying attention. Of course, I would miss a lot of interesting things. Well, let's transition into uh, talking about sleep. And when we talk about sleep, we have to talk about circadian rhythms because it is our circadian cycle that drives in part our sleepiness and, and facilitates our ability to sleep when we do. And I, and I show this really to highlight the importance of the circadian clock, not the exact numbers because everybody's different, but I just wanna emphasize the fact that, you know, we are um, a um, finely tuned symphony and everybody should be playing together with great regularity for optimum health. And when we get misaligned, there are various consequences. Uh, and it, if they're long-term, of course, they can be very serious and, and lead to significant uh, disorders. And I wanna say that the degree to which we can invest in our circadian health is really gonna have big payoffs, both in terms of our mental and physical health as well. And, and to highlight the importance of circadian rhythms, I'll remind you that in 2017, the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine went to these three researchers who were responsible for working out the uh, molecular mechanisms uh, that are related to circadian rhythms. So don't you love a journal that calls itself Sleep Health? This is the journal of the National Sleep Foundation. And it's really fitting that in this inaugural, you know, volume one, number one um, um, version um, of, of this was an article by the distinguished sleep researcher, Charles Seisler um, at Harvard. And in this article, he really um, uh, emphasizes the degree to which it's vital um, for so many bodily functions that we get adequate sleep. And I'd like to show this article because it brings together so many of the different um, types of processes uh, that are related to sleep. So he first looks at sleep curtailment. So this is short term, not getting enough sleep for just a week or two. And this leads to increased appetite and food intake. Now, you know, we try to eat pretty healthy and, um, and maintain a normal appetite, but not overdo it in terms of food. So when people are, are sleep deprived, they have an increase in their appetite, tend to eat more. And in fact, the choices that are made tend to be pretty bad, more towards the um, junk food end of the spectrum. Sleep curtailment also leads to a decrease in insulin sensitivity and glucose tolerance. And who out there follows a healthy diet 
so that you don't have insulin sensitivity and, and glucose tolerance. And, and here, sleep curtailment uh, takes us in the complete wrong direction. Not getting enough sleep impairs the immune response to vaccination and also degrades the ability to resist infection. Clearly, both of these um, working together in a very bad way. So an investment uh, in you know, prioritizing sleep can help our health in so many different ways. And you know, not getting enough sleep undermines mood as well. And I'll, I'll digress for just a moment um, with this from the National Sleep Foundation. At the bottom, you can see vaccinations can be another way to help prevent illness. Getting enough sleep has been shown to help vaccines work in the body. There was a study done several years ago where healthy young individuals were brought into a laboratory setting. And some of them were allowed eight hours in bed to sleep, and some of them were limited to four hours in bed, so clearly they were significantly sleep deprived. After doing this for a week, they all got flu shots. And then a few weeks later, the antibody production was measured, and are you surprised to learn that those people who were sleep deprived had blunted responses to um, getting the flu vaccine? There was another interesting study that was done a few years ago as well, that looked at the susceptibility to illness. Now, here's what they did. They recruited um, healthy people and they monitored their activity for a week. They, the people kept track of when they were sleeping and they all wore activity monitors. So um, that was able to give um, you know, another perspective on their activities and particularly be able to estimate when they were sleeping. So then they, put everybody individual in, in quarantine situations and they all got nose drops of a rhinovirus. And so they were kept for, for five days and then they measured the people who were infected and the vast majority of them were infected. But they also looked at those people who got sick, who caught colds, and that was not very many of them. But guess who the people were that were much more likely to catch a cold from that. Those were the people who were sleeping six hours or less compared to those who were had been sleeping more going into the study. Well, here are a few more examples from, from Dr. Seisler's article. So before we looked at you know, just short-term curtailment, here is habitually short sleepers have increased Lots of obesity. Well, you know, we follow a, a healthy diet um, to try to stay at a healthy weight. They have increased risk for incident calcification of the coronary arteries and, and incident, that is new onset of coronary heart disease. How many of us follow a plant-based diet so we don't develop coronary heart disease and yet uh, inadequate sleep may be associated with that? Well, obviously, we want to eat a healthy diet and avoid developing diabetes, yet um, there's an association of habitually short sleepers with increased onset of diabetes. Well, stroke as well, which is not a great surprise, and mortality. Well, we want to live long and live healthy with a, uh, a, a positive um, health span, and, and yet um, people who are shorter sleepers are less likely to achieve those. Who else thinks that sleep is important for the heart? Well, the American Heart Association does. Until a year ago, they highlighted life's essential seven. And then in November, 2022, they added sleep to the list and we now have life essential eight. Sleep duration is considered vital to heart health. How much should we sleep? Well, so here's an estimate, and this is also from the National Sleep Foundation, looking at different ages and sort of reviewing the literature. And you can see for young adults um, into uh, adults, even older adults, like seven to eight to nine hours, you know, typically is a, is a pretty good range. Um, younger children, uh, especially newborns and infants need a whole lot more sleep, but that's a, a good target, seven to nine hours for, for most people. So here's a question for you. Who thinks that eating a whole food plant-based diet decreases their risk for developing cancer? Uh, me? 
Maybe many of you do as well. Well, what's sleep got to do with it? Well, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the National Toxicology Program, says that there's a relationship, a causal relationship between human cancer and persistent night shift work. So those are people who are not getting enough sleep and they are misaligned, which also increases that risk for a variety of disorders, including these cancers. Uh, they highlight here at the bottom, the strongest evidence um, is for breast cancer, maybe secondarily for prostate cancer as well. And who thinks that eating a whole food plant-based diet decreases their risk for developing Alzheimer's disease? Okay, me, I think so. So sleep may be a big factor as well. There's been just a deluge of research over the past decade about the relationship of sleep and the clearance of metabolic byproducts in the brain. So there's something called the glymphatic system. We've known about the lymphatic system for a long, long time. And it was known that the brain didn't have a lymphatic system, but pretty recently it was discovered and named this glymphatic system, which is a mechanism for, for fluids in the brain to clear out metabolic byproducts. You know, our, our brain is such an active organ, there are toxic things that can potentially build up. And so this glymphatic system is a, is a clearance mechanism. And you can see um, uh, there's this convective flow and these little dots of waste. Some of those dots of waste are beta amyloid, which is the gunk that builds up and contributes to Alzheimer's disease. Well, this glymphatic system flow is occurring mostly when we are asleep. It's probably round the clock, but it is very clearly enhanced during sleep. And some people hypothesize that, that probably one of the key functions of sleep is this, to allow this sort of rinsing out of, of these metabolic byproducts in the brain while we are asleep. All right, here's another question for you. Can a whole food plant-based diet improve sleep? Seems an appealing notion. Well, there are articles out there. Um, here's one from just last year. Um, diet composition and objectively assessed sleep quality and narrative review, looking at the uh, literature out there. And these researchers said in general, diets rich in fiber, fruits, vegetables, and anti-inflammatory nutrients and lower in saturated fats, well, like with a Mediterranean diet, were associated with better sleep quality. And here's another related article, the association of plant-based diet index with sleep quality in middle-aged and older adults. And this is something called the um, Healthy Dance Study. And here's what they found. We found unhealthy plant-based diets are significantly associated with poor sleep quality, adherence to overall plant-based diets, especially healthy plant-based diets was positively associated with optimal sleep quality. And what if you have obstructive sleep apnea and you're too sleepy during the daytime, which of course often occurs with that disorder, might a whole food plant-based diet help? Well, these researchers looked and they said, our results suggest that a whole food plant-based diet could be a viable dietary intervention to reduce symptoms of daytime sleepiness. So let's talk about calories and weight. So you know, we were taught that calories, if you eat a certain number of calories that you can measure for, for different kinds of food, well, um, that's gonna lead to a certain amount of weight. Or if you exercise and burn up a certain number of calories, then you will lose a certain amount of weight. And that kind of makes sense. But, you know, the association is a whole lot more complicated than that. Um, although I use a kilogram here, you know, most of us were taught with a pound, 3,500 um, um, kilocalories. But in fact, you know, those number of calories really don't directly correlate with our weight. Now, obviously, eat a whole lot 
gain weight, eat less, lose weight. There's that same relationship. But this is complicated by certain things. First of all, the food that you eat has to get absorbed for it to contribute to a weight ultimately. But the other factor that I'll emphasize today has to do with our circadian rhythm and therefore has to do with the timing of when we eat, which now we know is really critical. And we live in a 24 hour society to a certain extent. And so it's kind of easy for people to be eating at all sorts of different times, you know, starting the day with a bagel and a banana and a donut and lunch and fries and afternoon snacks, and then some salad and lasagna and some wine and a midnight snack before going to bed and then, you know, sleeping a little bit and starting the whole thing over again. Well, kind of scary. So what are some alternatives? There's time restricted eating. So this is a research study that looked at a 10 hour time restricted eating, showing that it reduces weight and blood pressure and atherogenic lipids in patients with metabolic syndrome. So these, these are people who already um, have these diagnoses that contribute to the metabolic syndrome. And at their baseline at the top, so these people had uh, you know uh, elevated weight circumference and blood pressure and blood glucose and triglycerides and low HDLs. And so these are people who were eating at various times over a 14 hour period. And so if they started at um, eight in the morning, maybe they're going till 10 p.m. And what they did was over a 12 week period, they had them follow a 10 hour time restricted eating schedule. And after these 12 weeks, these same people with the metabolic syndrome now had decreased weight, decreased weight circumference, decreased blood pressure, decreased LDLs, decreased other uh, cholesterol values, the decreased A1C and more restful sleep. Just following uh, this, this 10 hour time window of eating. And I want to highlight something in this article, keeping an eye on circadian time in clinical health and medicine, because it's an example of a relationship that has been demonstrated in a lot of different studies, but um, these authors bring it out very clearly here. And the conclusion is that you can take a meal and eat it in the morning and have a certain metabolic response, in particular, um, a decrease, uh, I mean, an increase in glucose and uh, insulin release, uh, of course, in response to the meal. But if you have that identical meal in the evening, in the biological evening, as opposed to the biological morning, well, there's a much unhealthier response to the same food. There is a bigger increase in glucose and typically a bigger increase in the insulin response as well. And they showed uh, this highlights the importance of circadian timing on human health and disease management, such as diabetes. Eating earlier is a healthier thing to do metabolically in terms of our circadian clock. And here, uh, um, a report, um, many people may be familiar with uh, Hannah Kaliova who's um, now with the Physicians Committee with Neil Barnard, but uh, was at Loma Linda when this study came out. Meal frequency and timing are associated with changes in body mass index in the Adventist Health Study too. And what they found was our results suggest that in relatively healthy adults, eating less frequently, no snacking, consuming breakfast, and eating the largest meal in the morning may be effective methods for preventing long-term weight gain. And one would imagine other comorbidities uh, that may go along with obesity. Regular breakfast consumption seems to increase satiety, reduce total energy intake, improve overall dietary quality, in increasing especially consumption of fiber and nutrient-rich foods commonly consumed at breakfast, reduce blood lipids and improve insulin sensitivity and glucose tolerance 
at a subsequent meal. So just by eating breakfast, you're going to have a healthier metabolic response to the lunch that you eat than if you had skipped breakfast. Let's talk about this for a moment. Better known as melatonin. Melatonin is of great interest. Melatonin has been around approximately forever. Uh, likely um, plays many different roles uh, of interest to me in terms of its um, role in the regulation of the sleep-wake cycle. Uh, but also, you know, people are interested in using it sometimes to try to sleep better. But it's also an excellent indicator of the metabolic biologic day versus the biologic night. So let me talk a bit about the regulation of the sleep-wake cycle. This is going on for all of us every day. So this shows a 24-hour period from about 9 a.m. one day to 9 a.m. the next day. And at the top, you see homeostatic. So the homeostatic drive that's involved in the regulation of the sleep-wake cycle is simply the balance of how much we're awake and how much we're asleep. So as humans, we're driven to want to sleep about one third of the time, so about eight hours out of a 24-hour period. We know that if we don't get enough sleep, the consequence is that we are excessively sleepy as a result. And hypothetically, somebody could be sleep deprived because maybe they're getting six hours of sleep every night instead of an optimal seven, eight, or nine for them. Or um, somebody could acutely be awake all night long and be even sleepier the next day. So there is, there is that balance. Then there is our circadian system, which is typically synchronized to the photo period, to the, the day-night cycle. So both of these together work hand in hand under normal circumstances to allow us to be um, active and awake in the morning through the afternoon and into the evening and then sleep at nighttime. So if you look at these downward arrows at the top, these represent the homeostatic drive. So assuming this person slept well the night before, they wouldn't have much of a sleep drive. But as the day goes on, the arrows get longer and longer and longer until the person is able to sleep. And the process of sleeping reverses that, um, that homeostatic drive to get the person ready for the next day. But hypothetically, from the homeostatic perspective, it wouldn't matter when sleep occurred. So in theory, somebody could sleep for one hour and then be awake for two hours and sleep for an hour, be awake for two hours, sleep for an hour, be awake for two hours, do this around the clock, and you would have the opportunity to get in your eight hours of sleep. Clearly, we don't do that. And the reason is because of our circadian system, which really rescues us in a sense. You know, a typical experience is for someone to get up in the morning, they're okay, and they're busy and active, and then into the early afternoon, you know, what we might think of as siesta time, have sort of a dip in alertness, but if they keep on going, well, they don't get sleepier and sleepier. Usually by late afternoon into the evening, people have kind of a second wind. In fact, typically we are the most awake and alert in the evening than any time throughout our whole day or night. So, the reason is, and you can see those upward arrows from the circadian system, there is maximum arousal from the circadian system in the evening, which is countering that homeostatic sleep drive. And so while somebody might have um, had that siesta sleepiness in the afternoon, it is the circadian system that is rescuing them, allowing that person to be active, you know, well into the evening until their bedtime. Well, then when the circadian arousal drops off, it's leaving that homeostatic sleepiness unopposed. And so that's why somebody, say, might be wide awake and alert, you know, now um, East Coast time, uh, you know, 8 p.m., and getting into bed at 10 p.m., perhaps they'd be able to fall asleep fine because that circadian arousal has decreased at that point. 
So it is the interplay between these two. And obviously they can be dissociated, at least temporarily with jet lag, uh, somebody doing night shift work, these don't line up right. And so there are consequences to that. What's melatonin got to do with this? Well, melatonin, typically low throughout the daytime, rises in the evening, a couple of hours before our habitual bedtime. And when melatonin interacts with melatonin receptors, they serve to quiet down that circadian arousal, facilitating sleep onset by you know, decreasing the stimulation uh, and allowing that homeostatic sleep drive to, to be the, the primary factor. So here's a quick view of some of these relationships. Uh, you know, outside there's light, there's the photo period, light during, during the daytime, darkness during the nighttime, and the retina has, in addition to the rods and cones that we know are very important for vision, there also are these intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells that are not about vision, but there are photochemical reactions that occur in the retina. And it's a very short trip from the retina back through the, the um, retinal hypothalamic tract to the hypothalamus, which is where the SCN, the suprachiasmatic nucleus is. And this is really the timekeeper, the master clock of our circadian rhythm. And from that point, with regard to melatonin, it's a short route to the paraventricular nucleus and then a really circuitous route through the superior cervical ganglion up to the pineal gland, which is kind of like an island in the brain. There aren't other direct connections uh, with, with other parts of the brain, uh, but it is the suprachiasmatic nucleus that tells the pineal gland when to make melatonin, and when it's made, it's released into the bloodstream, into the cerebrospinal fluid, really functioning kind of as a hormone. And so the body knows what time it is, in a sense, based upon uh, the release of the, of the melatonin. And so it is the suprachiasmatic nucleus uh, that has that, that key role. And so we can see that there's this signal from the SCN over to the pineal gland. But what happens next is that the suprachiasmatic nucleus itself has a lot of receptors for melatonin. And so it creates this, this feedback loop. It, um, it, 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 it's like the, it makes the robust cycle that, uh, that we experience. Like when we get jet lag, it takes a while, several days for us to readjust because this rhythm needs to be shifted. So what happens in the suprachiasmatic nucleus from the, from the melatonin is, first of all, it reduces that arousal. And secondly, it simply reinforces the timing of this 24 hour rhythm. So our own internal endogenous melatonin, well, like I said, it's a hormone produced by the pineal gland with timing controlled by the circadian system, specifically by the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So our melatonin blood level is low throughout the daytime. It gradually rises in the evening as bedtime approaches. It's relatively high during the nighttime period. It declines at the end of the normal sleep period in the morning. Curiously, for those blind individuals who, who cannot perceive light at all, there may be a free running cycle for those individuals. You know, we have a cycle uh, that's 24 hours because it's reset every day by the photo period. People who cannot take advantage of that may have internal circadian cycles that are a little bit longer every day, which uh, for some of them can develop sleep problems and other, other difficulties. All right, so under normal circumstances, melatonin will facilitate our sleep onset by suppressing evening circadian arousal. And it's not really intrinsically sedating. You know, it's not like a sleeping pill that will put somebody to sleep. And, and here's one reason why we know that. And that is that, you know, as humans, we are a diurnal species. We are active in the daytime when our melatonin is low. We are sleeping at nighttime when our melatonin is high. Okay. And it kind of makes sense that maybe if you take some melatonin, it's going to enhance that process. And so, 
people do, and sometimes that's beneficial. But think about the fact that there also are nocturnal species that are sleeping during the daytime and they're active at nighttime. So what happens to their melatonin cycle? Well, it's no different than ours. They are sleeping in the daytime when their melatonin is low and they are active at nighttime when their melatonin is high. And so it, it really helps confirm that conclusion that melatonin itself is not really sedating, rather in humans in particular, it facilitates sleep by decreasing arousal around bedtime. There's been a whole lot of research about melatonin and some of it relates to these circadian rhythm issues and the timing of eating, which is part of the reason that I wanna tell that part of the melatonin story. So here's an interesting conclusion from, from this research. Acute melatonin administration in humans impairs glucose tolerance in both the morning and the evening. So here's what these researchers did. They took uh, 21 healthy young women and they gave them either melatonin, five milligrams, or placebo at nine o'clock in the morning, one day, um, you know, the placebo another day. Uh, and then on two other days, they gave them the melatonin or a placebo uh, at nine o'clock in the evening. So we're in the realm of the um, circadian night as opposed to the um, circadian daytime, the biological night versus the, the, the biological day. So what they found was that acute melatonin administration in humans impairs glucose tolerance in both the morning and the evening. And when administering melatonin, the proximity to meal timing may need to be considered, particularly in those at risk for glucose tolerance, well, glucose intolerance, and none of us want to get close to that. So this is what's so interesting. So these are the, the two relationships. If you look at the top on the left, this is the morning, and you can see the, the, the darker squares during the three-hour glucose tolerance test. Well, those glucose values are a whole lot higher when the women were given melatonin as opposed to the, the, the dimmer line below when they were given a placebo. So that's pretty interesting, I think. And then below that, you can see the insulin response, which in the morning really wasn't significantly different. But now let's look at the evening. And you can see that with the melatonin given, uh, there was even a much higher glucose response and also, you know, just looking, even when they got the placebo, the, there was a, a, a much bigger increase in glucose over those three hours compared to what it was in, in the morning. And then down below, we see looking at the insulin, there also was a, a much greater amount released among the individuals or, or during uh, those nights that they were given the melatonin. And so, this emphasizes that difference between the um, biologic day and the biologic night, and it's more problematic to be eating during the biological night. And part of the reason seems to be in relationship to the presence of melatonin, whether it is our own internal melatonin, or as in this case, uh, melatonin that is given in the experimental situation. So lots written about this controversy about the, the good things and the bad things um, about both our internal um, melatonin and exogenous melatonin that people may take. And while well, the conclusion of these researchers was the concurrence of elevated melatonin concentrations with food intake decreases glucose tolerance, so that's a bad thing, uh, while high melatonin during fasting may facilitate beta cell recovery, which, which would be a good thing. And they say shift workers, night eaters, and melatonin users are susceptible to the adverse effect brought by the concurrence of food intake and high melatonin levels. Again, that's whether it is your own internal endogenous melatonin or melatonin pill or whatever other type of melatonin um, might be taken. So 
there should be caution. So here are some takeaway points if people are going to use melatonin. It might help with sleep onset. It's unlikely to help uh, with sleep maintenance later during the nighttime. Melatonin most likely would be helpful for people with circadian rhythm phase delay, the people who are the night owls, and the people with this non-24 hour disorder, um, particularly among um, totally blind individuals. There's limited support for jet lag and shift work. And someone might try a low dose of a half a milligram to three milligrams and more is, is really not better when it comes to melatonin uh, when people are taking it to try to sleep better. Should be used prior to bedtime, maybe by an hour or two, but not too early because you want to allow the food to digest first. So at least two hours after the last meal. And I'll argue as well, we should avoid eating late in the evening, even if not taking any melatonin at all. A couple other things I just want to highlight here at the end. Uh, healthy sleep habits are good for all of us, certainly for people with chronic insomnia disorder. But, uh, you know, all of us ought to try to follow as much regularity as we can. There are big payoffs for for good sleep habits and for, you know, the parallel um, circadian rhythm uh, habits as well. So we should uh, have a very regular schedule, uh, very regular bedtime routines and a conducive bedroom environment uh, that is dark. In fact, a recent study came out showing that even pretty dim light um, during the sleep period can have neg negative metabolic consequences. We don't want to have disturbing noise, uh, and so really, really quiet is good, or maybe some sort of background noise, but not TV, radio, podcasts, stuff like that. Um, better to have um, the, the, the hum of a fan or some other um, nice um, constant noise device. Cool temperature usually is good. And being active in the daytime, getting exercise, getting light exposure, especially in the morning, these will boost our circadian cycle and whatever is good for the circadian cycle is likely to be good for our sleep wake cycle as well. And clearly to sleep better, we should be mindful of the potential negative effects of substances like alcohol and nicotine and various other things that people might take. And of course, I will emphasize, and it will be no surprise at this point, that regular meal times, especially early meal times, are likely to be beneficial. I like to think of this as chrono rehabilitation. People who are sort of uh, in misalignment can sort of bring it back together and uh, oftentimes sleep a lot better, feel a lot better, have uh, better lab values as well. So that brings us back around to nice, healthy, relaxing, restorative sleep. And I'll end with this. It's not just what you eat that affects your health. It's also when you eat. So I will thank you at this point. Wow, Dr. Neubauer, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. So we have Jane Dorsey with us, a nurse practitioner with the uh, Rochester Lifestyle Medicine Institute staff. And by the way, she's available for individual coaching if you're interested. Jane, are you there or did you fall asleep? That's I was reading some really good questions and in the chat and in the question department, um, Jeff and Linda are asking um, about uh, the effects of taking the red eye and people who have to work night shifts. And I know I have some ideas about that, but I'd love to hear what Dr. Neubauer suggests. Well, so Jane, you 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 probably have some good suggestions as well. It's, it is a challenge and there's no great answer to that. Uh, when people are doing um, permanent night shift, usually they're not able to turn their whole system upside down. And so it's a challenge even though when people get off of night shift and they're really sleepy, sometimes they can go home and fall asleep fine because there's all that homeostatic buildup of sleepiness, but you don't have the benefit of the coordination with the circadian clock to help promote sleep later during the daytime. And so um, oftentimes people may get a few hours of sleep and then they wake up and if they're lucky, they can get a few more hours later in the day before they go in for their their shift again. So it is really not optimal from a circadian rhythm point of view or from a sleep point of view, but from a survival point of view, 
uh, for those people who need to do that, um, well, uh, they can they can get by. But you know, we saw that um, that report in the very beginning um, from Health and Human Services about increased risk of, of cancer as a result mm -hmm. of doing uh, mm -hmm. doing shift work. So it's been uh, recognized as a carcinogenic uh, behavior for uh, for a long, long time. What should people do? Well, um, try to create an environment um, at home that is really um, welcoming sleep, dark room, keep it quiet, make sure people don't, uh, people know not to use the phone. You know, sometimes people will turn to medications as a survival strategy in order to get several hours of sleep um, during the daytime before having to go in again. There are short acting medications that people might turn to uh, that will wear off quickly and allow the person to be functioning fine after that. But, um, you know, there are a lot of compromises along the way, unfortunately. But, you know, we are grateful to those people who do it because there are really important jobs in hospitals and uh, uh, first responders that we really depend on being there. Uh, and it's a sacrifice, I think, that they make to do that. So we appreciate it. Yeah, they, the, the need for sleep is is there. And I think as a provider in sleep medicine, I'll let folks know that a dollar more per hour working night shifts, like what I used to make as a nurse in the hospital a long time ago, really doesn't add up to very much. Um, and it's really, I think young people can do the night shifts for a period of time or younger people, but it's not the best idea to make it a career because the World Health Organization, as you were saying, has determined that long-term night shift work is carcinogenic. It, there's so many things that point uh, to, to the problem. So trying to maintain the same sleep schedule on the days off, that's difficult to do with family and social obligations, but letting family know that sleep is important. You're not uh, home during the day to babysit and then go to work at night. And so trying to delineate some boundaries but for someone taking the red eye flight, trying to get enough sleep, um, having time to recover. Um, and then I think what you're saying, timing of when we eat, if it's just a short term uh, sleep um, uh, malalignment of the of the circadian rhythm, we can recover if we allow ourselves. But to think we're going to do it by um, ignoring uh, what's happening by taking caffeine, that can be a problem. Yeah, try to sleep. You know, taking that red eye flight uh, can be awful, but uh, if you can do everything you can to, to sleep on the flight, uh, that's going to be better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll do um, the next question. Uh, okay, Jay. thanks. Sure. So, um, what about people with a cycle not in alignment with the photo period? For example, someone who sleeps at 3 a.m. and wakes up at 12 noon habitually for the long term, what kind of health risks are there? And along the same lines, what is the ideal time to sleep? Oh, oh well, that's a tough one. Um, I, there's not an exact time because everybody has different circadian rhythms, and there's a spectrum of ranging from those early birds who naturally get sleepy by you know eight or nine p.m. and routinely go to bed and then wake up on their own and it's five o'clock, four or five, and they've gotten enough sleep and they feel great throughout the daytime. And who can argue with that? And then there are people on the other end of the spectrum who can't get to sleep until you know midnight or one or two, and then can sleep until mid-morning at that point. We see patients who are diagnosed with circadian rhythm disorders, and I see people who can't fall asleep, and no matter how hard they try, until three, four, five in the morning, and then given the opportunity, can keep on sleeping till the next afternoon. And while you know maybe somebody doing night shift work uh, that works out okay for them, uh, but for a lot of other people, it's just out of sync with the rest of society, and so they struggle in a lot of ways. Um, especially um, people who are in school, um, teenagers and college students can fall into this this trap of being up at night doing all sorts of things. Um, and then sleeping and missing uh, other important activities like work or, or exams and things like that. Uh, we, we have strategies to try to prop up and shift the clock and it may relate to strategic light exposure at certain times and of course darkness at others uh, and other activities. But um, it, it, it's a challenge to, to change times. But mm -hmm. um, you know we, we, we seem to have evolved to sleep at nighttime. And so that, that certainly seems like the, the healthiest thing to do. 
Very well, thank you for that. Jane, what do we got? Um, how about the um, uh, daylight savings time? I know American College of uh, Sleep Medicine has been working on legislation for years. Um, what Dr. Neubauer's thoughts are on daylight savings time? I go with the science. We, yeah, we we need permanent standard time. I I appreciate the appeal the appeal of people who um, would like to have permanent daylight saving time, but it is so anti science. And yes, people sleep less. They are in permanent misalignment. Uh, there are just so many increased risks that go along with that. It's nice to have you know that light later in the evening. But mm. uh, we really don't need it then, and and by by having daylight saving time, we are stealing it from the morning. And I'm old enough to remember back in '73 when yeah. we did do that year round, yep. and it was just awful, and it was reversed immediately. And the the biggest problem was in the winter time with daylight saving time, <laughs> it was so dark out, so late in the morning children waiting for school buses mm -hmm. and more commuters mm -hmm. on the roads in pitch blackness. There were many deaths associated mm -hmm. with it and other tragedies. Mm -hmm. the, the proponents say, oh, it's for the farmers. The farmers don't want to get up in the nope. dark and milk cows and, you know. The cows the don't field. change. You're um, right. Uh, <laughs> the yeah. cows don't change. You know, it's really commercial interests that uh, are promoting the permanent um, daylight saving time, um, convenience stores, uh, golf courses, uh, mm -hmm. and it, these sorts of businesses that think they'll get more money if it's light out later. But it is really, it is stealing the light that we need in the morning and we really should be permanent standard time year round. Yeah. Very no. good. All right, thank you for that. Um, so here's um, a question from somebody who says they have a delayed circadian rhythm what are the best times to eat and how much? And also from that same person, also despite having a delayed circadian rhythm, I have, I have very early morning awakening and the sleep physician I, says, I see says there is nothing she can do for me. So first, could you, define, could you define delayed circadian rhythm for us, please? Sure. So we've talked a lot about circadian rhythms today. And for the most part, you know, our, our genes are... Um, are, are timed such that we're naturally sleeping from you know, 10 or 11 until six or seven in the morning, somewhere thereabouts. And those people who have a natural tendency to be a whole lot earlier are the advanced sleep phase people. And those people who are later are the delayed sleep phase people, the, the, the night owls. And being a little bit of a night owl, not necessarily a bad thing, but there are people who are severe night owls and it's very problematic for them. And it's like, like trying to move a mountain. Uh, the circadian system uh, doesn't really want to budge, but there are things that, that we can do to try to help people. And it takes a lot of effort, kind of like weight loss takes a, a lot of effort as well. And so if people really want to change, there are things they can do. Um, and so we'll look carefully at the typical timing of sleep onset and when they're getting up and we may schedule bright light exposure or outdoor ambient light exposure at a certain time and gradually shift that earlier. By the same token, we want to um, maximize um, darkness and relaxing behaviors in the evening, You know, not people on their phones doing things uh, right by their eyes until the moment they wanna try to fall asleep. So we wanna get rid of those uh, influence in the in the evening. You know, one suggestion that we all often offer is using um, red lights with a low color temperature for a few hours in the evening because those are less likely to suppress melatonin, which of course makes the problem even worse. We really want to take advantage of our own endogenous melatonin to help facilitate sleep onset. So keeping it relatively dark, but maybe one of these. Um, Sometimes they're promoted as sleep bulbs, these reddish low color temperature bulbs in the evening, as opposed to just being on around brighter lights in the evening. So quiet time, wind down time in the evening, maybe melatonin. You know, this is a population that it's probably most likely to be beneficial, taking a few hours before the current bedtime. And hopefully it's going to be a moving target 
so that if somebody gradually is able to fall asleep a bit earlier, um, they can take the melatonin a bit earlier as well. And so it may be beneficial just during the time that they're making that transition. And some people may benefit from holding on to a dose for a longer period of time to try to help be stable. As for mealtime, um, earlier, earlier is, is, is the answer. An exact time, I don't know, but um, probably earlier than uh, the person's eating right now. So hmm. nighttime yeah. meals and snacking through the night uh, definitely is making the problem worse. There's mm -hmm. no food that helps us sleep. There's no snack that helps us sleep. We want to think cookies and milk and cereal help us sleep, but they do not. And I agree with Dr. Neubauer completely. Um, four or five hours. If you really want to have a rich dinner at a holiday, have, have it at three in the afternoon. And the other thing about reentrainment of the circadian rhythm is a person can do this on their own if they want to go through a period of being very strict. And Dr. Dement, one of the big sleep doctors years ago, I, I think he called it boot camp for sleep and other doctors have different names for it. Um, essentially almost living like a monk for about two weeks. And it's, I, I don't know, Dr. Neubauer, if you agree, but keeping the same wake up time seven days a week can be a good start for re-entraining the circadian rhythm. And all these other things, of course, the, avoiding the light in the evening, don't don't fall asleep in the evening. That drains down some of the sleep promoting chemicals. Um, in the four or five hours before we actually go to bed, don't let sleep overtake you unless you're driving and you have to pull over. Are those things that sound right to you? Oh yeah, that's good advice. And in fact, uh, there is a, a published therapy that's in line uh, with, with Dr. Dement said, and that is um, um, camping therapy. So there yes. actually uh, are reports of um, people with delayed sleep phase syndrome who are, uh, who are brought into a camping therapy where mm -hmm. there are no electronics and you know there's only the photo period. And uh, mm -hmm. it's remarkably successful when it's dark uh, in the evening and there are no distractions. Mm -hmm. And then of mm -hmm. course, things pick up in the morning when the, when the sun comes up. And so yeah. you know, with, without our societies disturbance uh um th th we can better fall back into our natural rhythms uh, with the outside world yeah the the incandescent okay. light or the firelight in the early evening can also be like your red light the infrared light can be very helpful um in that process so i think camping therapy is a great idea um, but people can do it in their homes <laughs> without um without having to go out to the wild, but I love the, the camping therapy. Mm, that's great, I love that too. All right, here's a question from a physician. Can you comment on starting sleep before midnight versus going to bed after mid midnight, even if getting seven to nine hours of sleep? So I think what they mean is, does it, they're still getting seven to nine hours of sleep either way, but does it make a difference? Oh. Probably not, but I think there's still a lot of individual variation because we're, you know, we're we're simply different in terms of our circadian system genes. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't I don't think that uh, there's an an essential difference. I, you know, I would argue that probably um, going to sleep earlier in the evening would would be good. Uh, but you know, maybe somebody's melatonin is not coming up until a lot later. It's it's really a, a a broad range of the times that our melatonin reaches a certain low level. That's that's a standard for uh, research measures. And for some people, that might be seven o'clock in the evening, and for other people, it might be midnight. And so mm -hmm. that timing really has a lot to do with driving our ability to to fall asleep and presumably then uh, stay asleep later during the night. Just to... uh, Ted, there's a question uh, about more uh, information on meal times. I think consistency is the most important. And Dr. Neubauer has answered that earlier in the day for the larger meal and the fiber, all that should be earlier in the day. Um, if someone goes to bed at 10 o'clock and eats a 5 p.m. dinner, that can work out fine. Yeah, sounds good to me. Well, how about this? Is it is it possible a healthy person only needs six hours of sleep and is if they're functioning well? You know, most of the people who are getting six hours are less, um, you know, have some sort of impairment that is, is simply not obvious. 
and they're likely to be sleepy in the daytime and maybe they push through and maybe there's you know caffeine involved as well but um, six hours is is is, is pretty short and um, oh yeah I, I, people we get by on six hours for 30 years and think that that's all we need but we're not at our best and there's a good chance we're missing out on delta sleep or stage three sleep in the first couple hours of the night we might get a half hour of stage three sleep and that's a key time for that brain cleaning activity when the brain waves are big and wide and delta sleep um, and there's uh, cerebral spinal fluid is pulsating in our brains. It's literally part of what helps clean away some of the metabolites that Dr. Neubauer mentioned that build up from just having a normal day of activity, um, being awake and uh, attentive to the environment, making decisions, thinking about things. So we build up all these byproducts of using our brain and if we get by on six hours of sleep, we may get by, but our personal best, our coping strategies, our uh, abilities to maybe do more than what we think and, and have better uh, emotional range, that can be um, that can be muted. But there are there are few people in the world who can really be as healthy um, at I think Dr. Dinges did a lot of work in this area, David Dinges um, in California about the patients who are so sure they only need four hours of sleep until they participate in a research project and start getting more sleep and start uh, seeing changes in their ability to surpass their own uh, normal um, abilities in, in attention and memory. So another question here is about um, taking medicine to fall asleep. And the medicines may conk out, they make us lose the resistance for sleep. Um, but they're not fixing the sleep mechanisms that help us go to sleep, stay asleep, and wake up fully refreshed. So a medicine like trazodone was asked in the QA here. Those medicines can be a beginning as you take other steps to change the pattern that has been preventing a person from getting into deeper sleep. And uh, cognitive behavioral therapy for sleep is a way to do this, either on your own or with the uh, someone like Dr. Neubauer, who may uh, may do this in a clinic situation. And sure, so Dr. Dr. Neubauer, what are your thoughts on medications? For some, Someone else asked a similar question. Uh, I guess it was about Ambien. How do we get, help people transition away from those medications? How can they, uh, so Dr. Neubauer, how, what can they do to get off those medications and then kind of readjust their sleep cycles? Well, I, so the, the answer is the opposite. Um, to get off the medicine and readjust their sleep cycle, how about readjusting their sleep cycle so they can get off the medicine? And that's what I mean by the chronotherapy, uh, and chrono rehabilitation. So right. I think that the degree to which people follow more regularity and, and you know, boost the robustness of their circadian system is going to allow them to, to sleep better and, and then perhaps be able to transition off of, of a medication. I think there's a role for sleep medications. You know, I prescribe them for patients that I see in our sleep disorders clinic. Uh, I think that, um, you know, a lot of people don't need to, to go down that path uh, if they're, you know, following good lifestyle choices. What else do we have here, Jane? question about magnesium glycinate to help fall asleep two hours or so before bedtime. And actually that is the compound that can help um, bring about a little bit of drowsiness. But again, making sure all the behavioral um, patterns are, are set up for success. Uh, avoiding screens of all kinds, phone, television, a uh, laptop, uh, bright light, uh, fluorescent lights, um, Strong lighting, uh, even like in a gymnasium, uh, it can be too bright right in the hour or two or three before bedtime. Um, so magnesium glycinate, yes, it does can cause some drowsiness, and that is the way it's absorbed. Um, th that's the compound that's absorbed uh, more easily for uh, helping with consolidating sleep. But it is not a solution, just like taking uh, melatonin is not a solution. Um someone's asked about kiwi fruit and well if you have that as part of your healthy meal at uh breakfast or lunch um but i wouldn't say eat kiwi fruit like right before bed and a, a mint tea is a big favorite sleepy time tea um you could have that a couple hours before bed but i advise my patients not to drink anything in the hour before they go to bed um 
just if you're thirsty or dry, swish water and spit it out because silent gastric reflux can occur uh, once we lie down and uh, and go to sleep. So we're really not shouldn't be catching up on our water. Um, some people yeah. take that too far, though. I, I've seen patients who tell me that uh, they won't have a, have a drop of liquid from, you know, like 5 p.m. onward because they were afraid that they might need to pee in the middle of the night. Yeah, so that's you think too about long. The fact that our, our brain is mostly made of water um, and we want it yeah. to function well. And one of its most important functions is sleep. So yes. um, I, I agree. Uh, you know, a whole lot of... Uh, fluid right before bedtime is, is probably not a good idea, but uh, nor, nor should we um, be too, too, too thirsty when we're going to bed. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Dr. Neubauer, here's a question. Uh, I fall asleep pretty well around 10 p.m., but typically wake up at 3 or 3.30, and then I'm awake for uh, I'm awake for an hour before I fall back to sleep. Dr. Neubauer, any suggestions? That's so frustrating, and uh, that is the most common sleep problem that people have. You, you know, mm -hmm. it's not really getting to sleep. It's Getting it's sleeping and then waking up at some point at two, three, four o'clock in the morning and either not being able to get back to sleep at all, or maybe, you know, being awake for an hour or so and then getting back to sleep for a bit right before the alarm clock goes off. And it's so frustrating to have to get up at that point. Mm -hmm. Well, um, the, the, um, our, our colleagues who do cognitive behavioral therapy have a lot of good advice and will help people with their schedules and perhaps you know restrict sleep temporarily and work on the, the, the cognitive aspects of uh, the challenges <clears throat> related to getting enough sleep. And so cognitive behavioral therapy is, is, a, is a good way to go for somebody who is suffering um, a whole lot. You know, one consideration, um, and, and I emphasize this because there's no one size fits all, you know, we, we, we preach regularity, but not exact timing regularity for, for everyone. For some people, um, maybe going to bed earlier is the answer. There are, you know, so many people are, are going to bed 11 p.m. When in fact, you know, under the right circumstances, if they were going to bed at 10 or 9.30, they can probably fall asleep fine. And so there may be a better opportunity to add sleep on the front end, rather than wishing that they could sleep later, somebody who might be waking up at 5 a.m. wishing they could sleep till 6 or 6.30, well, you know, maybe their clock is simply timed for them to wake up at 5, but, you know, they could fall asleep eight hours before that, or perhaps even a little bit more than that. So we tend to get caught up in so many evening activities and television schedules uh, that are, you know, not, not essential to our lives. So I think that um, trying to gradually get to bed and fall asleep earlier without other distractions uh, and other environmental problems like too much light, um, I, I think that um, that's a strategy that people should think about more. I, I agree and not letting sleep um, overtake us in the evening and under no circumstances should we be watching TV laying on a couch. If we're that drowsy, get up, move around, we can't change our sleep-wake schedule in, in a night or in a week. It should be done, in my opinion, gradually. And I've seen it work better that way. Maybe even just 10 minutes. If you want to push the clock 10 minutes every week or 15 minutes every week, Dr. Neubauer, you may have better uh, insight in this, but the gradual change, whether you want to go make your bedtime earlier or later, it should be a very slow change um, and not staying in bed wide awake for like a half hour. Um, get up and do some very boring, useless activity. It has to be reading for no purpose and no enjoyment, um, not to watch TV if we're awake, um, but the bed is for sleep only. And if after 15 minutes, we're not asleep, don't interact with pets, people, snacks, or electronic devices, <laughs> sit in a chair and read something really dull and useless. Sounds good. Yeah. All right. One more question. Um, and I think we probably ought to call it a night, but um, this sounds unfortunate. My husband has Parkinson's dementia. He sleeps a lot during the day, even though I try to keep him awake. Then he's awake a lot at night, which means I am woken up numerous times at night as I am his caretaker. This is hard on me, though. He catches up in the day. So it sounds like they're both having issues with sleep. Any thoughts? Well, of, of course, it's a sad situation. And um, with Parkinson's and some other neurodegenerative disorders, there is sort of a breakdown in the whole circadian apparatus. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it makes it more likely that, um, you know, sleep is no longer um, 
in one period and wakefulness at, at another. You know, I mean, the only thing I could suggest is perhaps trying to um, maximize daytime light and activity um, for for him mm. so that um, it's possible that maybe there'll be more sleep at nighttime. There, there was a study that was done years ago that looked at nursing homes and they found that the uh, the residents were not asleep for like more than an hour at a time during the nighttime. Hmm. But they also recognized that nor were they awake for more than an hour at a time. So the degree to which we can have people uh, under more light in the daytime, more stimulation in the daytime, more wakefulness and biological stimulation again, again from light. Um, mm. And then, you know, darkness at nighttime. And of course, in many of these nursing homes, they're not particularly dark in the bedrooms for safety reasons or whatever else. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's the only suggestion I can make is, you know, if there's some possibility of more light, going outdoors, whatever exercise is possible um, might help a little. Sounds like good advice. I'm just going to uh, put up a, a slide I have to kind of cl close things out, which is a, a little uh, self-promotion for Rochester Lifestyle Medicine Institute. These are the medically facilitated programs that we run. Uh, well, this one is medically facilitated uh, the 15-day whole food plant-based jumpstart. We've had over 2,000 people go through that program uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, since 2018, since we started giving it every month. Over 250 doctors around the country have referred patients at one time or another to that program. Uh, if you're one of those physicians, we thank you. And if you're not, we'd love it if you'd uh, see what happens when you send a patient to our program. And, um, and then we also have the Lift Project, which is uh, meets uh, once a week for 10 weeks, a wonderful program to help lift people's mood. And then, if we, of course, we have uh, individual and group health coaching. Uh, individual health coaching, you can start anytime. You can even get uh, Jane uh, Dor Dorsey as one of your uh, coaches if you're interested in sleep coaching. We are having a group coaching event beginning on January 23rd of next year. Uh, up to 12 people can participate together, uh, uh, which is uh, going to be weight loss, optimizing uh, nutrition. Please follow us at Rock Life Med on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, and um, Facebook. Dr. Newbar, thank you so much. Do you have any final final words before we um, give it a... Uh, well, uh, just my message is prioritize sleep. Uh, it's a You get a big return on your investment. Great. Thank you so much. And Jane, thank you for thank helping with questions and for your sage you. advice. And good night, everybody. Get some get some sleep. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Newbauer. Good night. Good night. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Orange Newbauer, Frankie.